Welcome back, everyone, as we continue our conversation about the Irish potato famine. Uh, if you did not see the first three episodes of this series, there's a link in the description below that will take you back to the beginning. Uh, big shout out and thank you to all of our patrons who make uh, this channel possible, who make my original content possible. Speaking of original content, the next episode in my series from France, from the battlefield of the Somme, will be coming out tomorrow. Uh, so be watching for that. And uh, we're ready to just go ahead and dive right into part four using Extra History's series on the Irish potato famine. Let's do it. Fiddles and song carry out the door of the house as neighbors slip inside to pay their respects. It's awake. Two sisters, girls the town has known their whole lives will never more be among them. The neighbors approach the girls, shake their hands, and kiss them. For these girls are still alive. Yet by tomorrow, they may as well be in their graves. They've saved enough for the Atlantic Passage, and tomorrow will leave the town that until now has made up their whole world. This goodbye party is what's known as an American wake. Their mother cradles them, sobbing, knowing that when they disappear down the bend, she'll never again see them. Hmm. In a time before photographs and telephones, she will have nothing of them, except perhaps a lock of hair and a fading scent on empty bed sheets. So technically, technically it's not a time before photographs. Photography uh, is invented by this time. It's not something that's available to most people, certainly not to poor people in Ireland, but there are uh, photographs by this point. Uh, the earliest photographs we have from the 1940s are known as daguerreotypes. Uh, they were uh, created by this guy named, named Daguerre. Actually, a little bit of a side thing. Let's talk about the history of photography a little bit. So the, only, uh, the oldest known photograph was taken in 1826 by a Frenchman. Um, and, and he and Daguerre actually got together and worked together on the process. You can see it's pretty grainy uh, and, and not real doesn't really show a lot and here's uh, i think the oldest photograph to ever show a person in it right here and you can see that um but daguerre the oldest daguerreotypes i think date to like 1837 there's the oldest known daguerreotype which was the earliest kind of widely used photographic process and a lot of the earliest photos that we have are daguerreotypes um so here's that one uh taken in 1838 uh so it's believed to be the most reliable uh, photograph to include people. Uh, and so by the, by the 1840s, daguerreotypes are really popular. Uh, and we have them for, you know, here's Louis Daguerre himself right there in 1844. There's a congressman-elect Abraham Lincoln in 1846. Uh, and so there are a lot of photographs that go back to that time. Uh, but yeah, it may as well have not existed for people like this. But still, they must go. Irish immigration became a fact of life over a century before the Great Famine, but amid the horrors of 1847, it reached a fever pitch. That year, a stunning 214,000 people, out of a population of 8 million, left in search of a new life, where they could escape the hunger, disease, poverty, and surging violence. 1847 would prove the worst year of the famine. The British government had stepped up food aid and private charities had tried to fill the need, but it was too late. So here's the thing about traveling. It, it was not cheap. Uh, and depending on the time and place and the availability of travel, it could cost you several months wages, uh, if not more, to be able to get across. And so families often saved up for a long time. And a lot of times what happened was the father and husband in a family, he would go over, establish a residence, get a job, all of those sorts of things. And then when he had made some money, send that back over and send for the rest of the family, the mom and the kids to come over later on, sometimes years later. Uh, that was a very common thing. So if you're doing research into your family, you may find that they came over at different times because of that. And a lot of times people came over uh, because they heard from other people who had gone previously about a place to go. And so that's why you end up with, you know, a lot of Irish immigrants in one particular area or a lot of German immigrants in one area. Uh, Northeast Ohio, uh, in particular, Cleveland and Niles, 
Niles, which is right near where I live, became strong uh, enclaves of people from the West Midlands in England, uh, the area around Birmingham. Uh, a lot of steel workers who came from there. They call the area, uh, there's an area outside of Birmingham known as the Black Country uh, because of all the soot from all the factories that would fall. And a lot of my family came from the Black Country, an area known as Tipton. And uh, they all came, and, and you'll find people on the same street who aren't related to each other, but who came from Tipton because they heard from other people that this was a place you could go and get a job. And so uh, it attracts more and more people from the same areas. Disease had taken hold. The economy collapsed, and the cities filled with starving refugees coalescing around food distribution hubs. The old bonds of Irish life, the family and communal village, were tearing apart as people sought a way out even if it meant parting with those they loved. Irish living abroad in Canada, Australia, Britain, and the United States urged their families to come join them. Travel books began appearing in Dublin, laying out the different areas of Canada, where to settle, and how to get there. And I had somebody yesterday comment and say that they live in Colombia and that their family came from Ireland to Colombia. So it was a lot of different places that they would go and probably it was whatever ships were available and maybe where other family had gone. And you might wonder, well, if they had enough money, if it took several months wages or more to go on a ship, why didn't they use that money to buy food? Well, that shows you that the food wasn't available, whether you had the money or not. And you certainly, in most cases, people didn't have the money. And people went. But the people who left were, by and large, not those suffering the worst of the famine. Ship passage across the Atlantic was expensive, and prices could fluctuate every hour. Generally, a ticket to the United States cost about five pounds, while passage to Canada cost three. These were high sums, completely unattainable for those economically mm. ruined or working for sustenance on the famine roads. Therefore, it was not the poorest who immigrated, but rather those who still had some means. Small farmers who could sell land and equipment, for example. Immigrants tended to come from communities that were hard hit by the famine, but not so desolated as Skibbereen or other areas mm. in the West. There were, of course, other ways. Some landlords considered voluntary immigration the cheapest and most humane way to clear their land. One that, as a bonus, wouldn't put them under the threat of assassination in retaliation for evictions. They so, in some ways, paying for a person to go away was a better option. And I, and I can imagine a situation where you have the British people who are trying to reform and change Ireland saying, Yeah, I'll give you some money if you just go away, you Irish people. They offered to pay a certain number of tenants to sail to Canada and found themselves inundated with applications. Huh. The truly desperate, though, found an innovative solution. They would commit a crime in front of a police officer, hoping that the sentencing judge would transport them to Australia. Actually, when a sympathetic judge moved to acquit a pair of women after one of these crimes, they just threatened to simply walk out of the courthouse and do it again. <laughs> so... Uh, crime could be severely punished at this time. And there were two common methods of dealing with crime that didn't involve just throwing somebody simply into jail. Uh, transportation was what, what one of them was called, where they'd ship you somewhere else like Australia, for example. Uh, centuries before this, Georgia started as one of these penal colonies. Um, but Another thing they would do is they had these uh, ships that were called prison hulks. And they were basically the hull of a ship where everything else had been removed. And then they just turned the hull into a prison. And I had a couple of cousins that I've done some research into who ended up uh, in prison hulks uh, in London or in Portsmouth. Uh, not a fun place to be at all. And so they got what they wanted. Seven years at a penal colony in Tasmania. But even for those lucky enough to get to a port... The danger wasn't past. Dockside con men fleeced the new arrivals, charging huge commissions for buying tickets or provisions. Some sold expired tickets or provided ludicrous currency exchange rates. And then a ship's departure might even be delayed, forcing prospective travelers to rent rooms they couldn't afford. As a result, many who made it to the port of Liverpool found themselves unable to afford passage and melted into the city's underclass. And all of this for space on a ship not meant to carry passengers. And yeah, they called it steerage and it was kind of down in the basement with the rats and all that stuff. And 
Um, it's like third class is being generous to call steerage third class. Um, but and yeah, a lot of people made it from Ireland over to Wales or to Liverpool, but then never made it to Canada, or the United States or any of those other places. And, uh, you know, just ended up staying in, in England or in Wales. For the ships that plied the routes from Canada to Ireland were actually cargo vessels. They'd arrived in Cork or Liverpool, discharged their holds full of timber, and were hastily refit to carry Irish immigrants on the return voyage. And outdated British passenger laws mandated only 10 feet of space per passenger and 7 pounds of bread per week. The government knew these deficiencies were dangerous, but they wanted to encourage settlement in Canada. Tighter regulations would raise ticket prices, making Canada less attractive in comparison with the United States. The vessels on the Canada route quickly gained a dark nickname, coffin ships. Mm. The diseases festering in Ireland hitchhiked aboard, ravaging the passengers in the unventilated decks. Ship's crews fearing disease might keep the passengers as virtual prisoners below decks and even refuse to collect the dead. One ship, the Agnes, left Liverpool with 427 Irish passengers. It arrived in Quebec with 150. That was extreme. But in the 1840s... Wow. Like, two-thirds of them died? That's brutal. That's absolutely brutal. I, I hadn't realized it was that bad. Seven sailing season, it was not unusual for between 15 and 20% of Irish immigrants to die during the crossing. Those that survived languished on quarantine islands, unable to set foot ashore while the disease spread further in the tent cities. Conditions were so bad that the Bishop of Quebec sent a letter to the Catholic Church in Ireland begging them to preach against immigration. Huh. Yet, they came anyway, and they made it. Thousands of Irish settled in Canada, with others walking south towards the border and crossing into the United States. Down the East Coast, things were no better, despite the higher ticket prices. It had taken many Irish refugees all they had in order to afford passage to the United States. And if you look at some of the early situations, if you've ever seen uh, the movie, uh, trying to remember who made the, the movie Gangs of New York, um, you know, they show kind of the clash between the nativists, the people who you know, are British descent or have been in the United States for a few generations, and all these new Irish immigrants who arrive uh, in the 1840s. Uh, and then kind of start to grow up there and how it all comes to a head by the time of the American Civil War a generation later. And, um, you know, how these Irish people, they were not treated. I mean, they were treated like second class citizens. They were treated by the native uh, Americans and by the British immigrants, uh, the, the English immigrants, because uh, I guess technically the Irish were British at this point, um, but or at least from the UK. Uh, they were treated like second class citizens and a lot of them ended up in like almost like ghetto type situations where you'd have 20 people living in a house and uh, the conditions really weren't a whole lot better except at least there was food and few had the funds to move inland once they reached a port so people who had dreamt of farming in the west ended up clustering in cities like boston philadelphia and new york and though generations of irish immigrants had arrived before the so-called famine irish the newly arrived often found that their predecessors did not welcome them. Mm. Those earlier waves of immigrants skewed wealthier and Protestant, and old sectarian tensions continued to simmer in the New World. Canadian cities in particular were known for brawls and riots around sensitive dates like St. Patrick's Day and the anniversary of the Battle of the Boyne. And in both Canada and the United States, Irish immigrants, mostly Protestant, began referring to themselves as Ulster Irish or Scots Irish. To do and there's the thing I talked about before. Uh, began referring to themselves as Ulster Irish or Scots Irish. That term Scots Irish has become very prevalent here in the United States to refer to people of uh, that from that Northern Ireland uh, point of immigration. Uh, Scots-Irish is a very common thing for people to claim as their ancestry. And you can see now how people of that line of descent are going to look down on the, the Catholic Irish immigrants that came from the rest of the island, not from the Ulster uh, plantation in the north. Irish to differentiate themselves from the new underclass. In America, nativist societies sprang up pressuring the government to cut immigration and contain the new Irish immigrants that they considered both racially inferior and religiously subversive. 
A fringe political organization called the American Party, widely known as the Know Nothing Movement, arose to oppose immigration. And spinning conspiracy theories about Catholic plots to take over the United States, nativist groups formed criminal gangs like the Bowery Boys that harassed immigrants. And there you see a lot of that in the movie Gangs of New York. And, you know, listen, this, this whole anti-Catholic thing was pretty prevalent in the United States. In fact, in the 1920s, when the Klan makes a resurgence in the United States, a lot of it is not so much focused on African-American, former slaves, things like that. A lot of it's focused on immigrants, especially Catholic immigrants. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's only when John F. Kennedy is elected in 1960 that the United States finally elects a Catholic president, an Irish Catholic from Boston. Uh, and a lot of people had a lot of questions about whether or not an Irish Catholic could get elected president of the United States. That's how big a deal it still was. Doctors, hard air quotes there measured the heads and faces of incoming Irish immigrants, using pseudoscience to declare them racially inferior. Jeez. Newspapers breathlessly reported on the crime, hopelessness, and squalor of New York's largely Irish-American Five Points neighborhood, making it America's most famous slum. And look, the Five Points was horrible. Stately hotels became crowded tenements, their hall floors sitting uncleaned for so long that trash hardened and became part of the floor. Mm. In the 1850s, 55% of arrests in New York were Irish, and Irish women made up a quarter of the city's sex workers. Irish gangs like the Dead Rabbits clashed with the nativist groups like the Bowery Boys. In 1849, a dispute during a performance of Macbeth caused the state militia to open fire on the crowd, killing around 30 people. And in 1857, the Dead Rabbits and the Bowery Boys fought a citywide gang war that raged for two days. But... Recently, historians have found another side to the infamous Five Points. A new study of records at a New York immigrant bank discovered that a sizable number of residents had six months to a year's worth of salary saved. Hmm. A rainy day fund to get them through a crisis. Therefore, it appears that some stayed in the Five Points not because there was no other option, but because the cheap housing allowed them to save more, send money home to family, and yep. stay a part of an Irish community. Huh. And crucially, in New York, the Irish had a champion that would fight for them. And so there's a point to be made there that his, the, the understanding of past events is really never done. Uh, there's always new things to be learned. We're always always discovering things. I did a you know a short video this morning on today in history about the USS Maine, and you know I think it was only in the 1970s that we found out for sure that the Maine probably was not sunk by a mine in Havana Harbor, but rather from an ex internal explosion, probably from a fire that was going on. So that was 70 years after the event before we fully understood it. It was only in the 1980s that we confirmed that the Titanic broke in half at some point uh, in the process of sinking. That was something that wasn't really known for sure for 70 years of history. Uh, so we are still learning new things that we didn't know before. John Joseph Hughes had been born in Ulster and found his calling in the church. Not particularly spiritual, but aware of the political power the church wielded. Hughes used his position as bishop, and later archbishop, of New York to protect Irish immigrants and culture. In New York, Hughes saw a chance to rebuild Irish Catholicism, which was in ruins after centuries of religious oppression at home. Hmm. And he began using the First Amendment as a cudgel, demolishing architectural laws that forced Catholic churches to look like Protestant ones, hmm. and argued against the Protestant King James Bible in schools. He founded Irish Catholic schools and newspapers, and during and after Mass, he ran classes on how to assimilate to American culture. And when he had to, he played rough. In 1844, a nativist rally in Philadelphia turned into a riot, with nativists flooding out to beat immigrants and burn Catholic churches. Shortly afterward, the nativists scheduled a rally in New York. Hughes visited the mayor and delivered a clear message. If one Catholic church was touched, the Irish were prepared to burn New York to the <laughs> ground. <laughs> you gotta love this. It's like the old days of the warrior monk, right? Yeah, the, or the warrior priest. Uh, the yeah, the guy who's like, "Hey, I, I'm a priest. I'm a I'm a bishop. I'm here to help. I'm here to stand up for people. We'll burn it all to the ground if they touch us." I love it. The mayor canceled the rally. 
Other Irish moved west, into the coal mines of Pennsylvania and the gold fields of California. They worked construction, digging canals and laying railroad tracks, gaining a reputation for doing hard work well, finding their mm. place in these new lands. And they kept coming. Because in Ireland, blight had returned. The country they escaped would not see a full potato harvest until 1849. So uh, several of you have shared with me your stories that you've been asking questions and looking into things and finding out your connection to people who came over from Ireland during this time. Keep sharing those. I would love to hear those stories. As I mention all the time, I read every single comment on every video. I know that's a lot, but you know, several times a day I'm scrolling through just checking all the comments. Um, I, I get them on a timeline regardless of what video, so I don't have to go to each video to read the comments. But uh, even if I don't like, even if I don't respond, I do read them. So so thank you in advance for that. Please hit that like button if you would. We'll see you again tomorrow with part five. Thanks for watching.